Hi, I'm Tom DeRosa. We're doing a series called Exposing the Great Myths of Evolution. It's a seminar, and we are excited about this. We want to give people uh, reasons for their hope. We want to give them things to hold on to that they can remember and they can utilize like tools to give them the reason for their hope. And that's what we're doing this series. This myth is a very interesting one. I, I love this myth because it deals with something that we can easily get excited about. Did dinosaurs and human coexist together? So this kind of excites people because dinosaurs and humans, I thought they were millions of years separated. So we're gonna to talk to you about this. That's an evolutionary scenario. The first we had dinosaurs and then man came. And all of a sudden dinosaurs stopped existing. For some reason they became extinct and we don't, we can't figure out the reason why these dinosaurs became extinct. But the point is that uh, I believe that we had a great event, whether it be a meteorite hitting the earth or whatever, if it can kill a dinosaur, it's gonna kill everything else. I mean, if it's gonna kill life, there's gonna be very little bit left of it. And so um, we have to have plenty of life. The dinosaurs and humans coexist. And here's a myth, humans and dinosaurs never coexisted together. So they want to say to you, if you read the textbooks, humans and dinosaurs never, never live together. And if you believe that, then you're not so smart. That's what they tell me. You're going to fail the test. So what we want to do is first, we want to communicate with you. If you know the word of God and believe it's true, is mentioned in the word of God. The word of God gives testimony that dinosaurs live with humans. Two, there are a plethora of evidence that creatures that resemble dinosaurs or dragons roam the earth recently. I love to present that, that's fun. And the third thing is that a significant amount of current evidence demonstrating dinosaurs are not millions of years old. I would like to show you some evidence that shows you that dinosaurs basically are young like we are. We have this, this young earth phenomena that we call biblical, and we believe that dinosaurs and men coexisted because when God created everything in the first week, he created all the animals. He created us on the last day. He saved the best for last. I mean that. He saved the best for last. That was God's created order. But because he gave us the commandment that we would have to what? We would have to have dominion over them. So it makes perfectly good sense. So modern day fossils are found alongside the same layer, allegedly with 65 million year old dinosaurs. I have personal testimony of that because I actually dug up dinosaurs. So I'm gonna have fun sharing that with you. So four things, the word of God, uh, plethora of evidence that says that dinosaurs and dragons roam together. Uh, there's a significant amount of evidence all around us that dinosaurs are really young and modern day fossils are found alongside on, on digs, on actual digs, right along with modern day fossils. Okay, so I wanna set something straight. Um, you see the laboratory? We use the same evidence, evidence from rocks, bone stars, and living systems are interpreted to understand what happened in the past. The acquisition processing analysis of evidence always subject to error. And since no human has present was present to observe the origin of life. There is no uh, verbal evidence of how everything came to be. So that's a, that's important to understand that what we when we examine the past, when we talk about supposedly a million years ago or hundreds of millions of years ago, or in dinosaurs like T-Rex 65 million years ago, it tells us that um, you've got to kind of make a supposition. In other words, the hard evidence is not in front of you. Now there are various dating methods and so on, but those dating methods are always subject to interpretation because you were not there. The Bible uh, is very clear in Job, it says in chapter 38, uh, as God is te giving testimony to Job, he says, um, I will, uh, it came down from the heavens in chapter 38, God spoke to Job, and said, I will ask you, and he gave him 77 questions from chapter 38 to chapter 40, to, uh, up to 41. And he was demonstrating his unbelievable uh, glory and honor. He was showing Job all the creation and was just, just showing Job all, this, all, the, all the things that he made, including the dinosaur, which we'll be addressing right now. 
So myth, dinosaurs, uh, and, um, dinosaurs and humans never coexisted together. The word of God gives testimony that dinosaurs live with humans. Now, I don't know if you read the same Bible I do, but this is what it says in Job. First of all, let me uh, get the idea that the word dinosaur is never mentioned in the Bible, but the word dragon is. The word tannin means sea monster. And there are sea monsters in the Bible, like Leviathan. And the word Leviathan and tannin kind of go together. They're called dragons. So does the Bible use the word dragon? And the answer is yes, it does. Dragon was used 22 times in the older version of the King James Bible. And in Geneva Bible, it was used 24 times. The Greek text, the word was translated as dragon. And so you, you know that in those days, when they were looking around, they looked at things and they started to think of these monsters, these things. So we're going to be giving testimony about these monsters and these things that people actually saw with their own eyes and gave testimony to. So in the Bible, it says, look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength in his hips and his power in his stomach muscles. So we got an idea that this is a big animal and we're familiar with big animals. Take a look at this picture here and you'll understand what I'm talking about. There's elephants and a big giraffe. So I got my big animals right there. What do they eat? Everybody would agree with me. They don't eat meat. <laughs> they don't have steak at night or shrimp tomorrow night. No, what they eat is basically herbivores. They eat grass. They eat things like that. So the Bible talks about this behemoth, this creature. And he's going to talk about, this is Job 40. Job is now, God is speaking to Job. These are God's words, not Job's words not man's words, God's words. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. So we're talking about God's words. And he's talking about, he's talking to Job, Job, look. Now I, I've got this creature here and this eats grass like, like an ox. It eats grass like, um, like an elephant. It eats grass like a giraffe. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Now people have interpreted this because they look at modern day animals and say, oh, you know what? That must be an elephant or that must be a hippopotamus. Now, I've seen translations like that. What do you think? Does dinosaur mean elephant or does it mean hippopotamus or does it mean something else? Well, let's take a look at this. So we look at this and we see he moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his uh, thighs are tightly knit. Okay, so it gives us an idea that this tail has to be big. You follow me? So this is a cedar tree. So you got a big tail. I don't care what you're talking about. Give me a dinosaur with a big tail. So let's take a look at this. Observe. Do you observe? These are elephants. At, uh, this is some shot. I, I must tell you. They're all having a water. They're having a drink. You see? And notice their behinds. Notice more of their tails. And what do you see? Do you see uh, a cedar tree there? No. Not like a cedar tree. How about this guy? Is a cedar tree there? Hippopotamus? No. So right off the bat, you know they're not talking about uh, hippopotamus or an elephant. I mean, you're talking about big guy. And maybe an extinct guy. That's what I think they're talking about, an extinct animal. That's what Job is showing. He's showing, um, I mean, that's what God is showing Job. So let's take a look now, carefully, and let's read the scripture together. Job at 40, pick it up from 16 to 19. Okay, here we go. See now his strength in his hips and his power in his stomach, muscles. Now, as I'm reading, I want you to kind of draw a picture in your mind next to it. He moves his tail like a cedar. The snoos of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs are like, like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. So God's got to be, it's got to be a big creature, right? Big awesome so guess what i had a revelation you ever have revelations you get this idea look at this guy he's standing on his hind legs isn't he is that what job saw this is a barrel sword you maybe job saw this big guy standing on so his stomach is right out there 
you know, his thighs are there. I mean, I read this description, I got a big guy and he's standing on back of his back legs. Now we know about these guys, don't we? These big guys. Here's my little giraffe, 27 inch tongue. Um, he has 24 pounds uh, uh, in his, he has in his, um, in, in his heart, he weighs 24 pounds in one. Um, giraffe's neck is 550 pounds. He picks it up, big. Now, whether you know it or not, that neck is not Sal Le Bon, right? Let me show you what it is. The next picture will help you. This is a Brachiosaurus. You see it? Look at the structure of the neck. Look at it carefully. You'll see that it's like when you build, it's like built, like putting bars across each one, giving lots of space so it has movement. It's got to be hollow. It's got to be able to move. So Brachiosaurus has this very large, large head, neck, small head, but large neck, okay? A herbivore, plant eater. This is what they say. I just looked up the data for Brachiosaurus. You can find this anywhere, 40 to 50 feet tall. Um, that's about four stories to five stories, all right? Take a four-story building, say, that's my Brachiosaurus. It weighs 33 to 68 tons. You might say, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of full with these figures, 33. That's a big, big difference. Well, you know why? because the fossils are few and incomplete, but we know they existed. So when you go to the museum and you see these big brachiosauruses, know that we don't have a complete, we don't have a complete picture yet, but we have enough to kind of get an idea. Okay, so we use our imagination a little bit. Okay, unlike most other dinosaurs, the front legs of brachiosaurus are longer than the hind legs. So the front legs are longer than the hind legs. Now, this is amazing because if you understand the structure, how in the world could they stand on their hind legs? Well, I think they had the ability to do that because if their body was hollow, we find with big animals like elephants, the mammoths we find, their, their heads are hollow because as the bigger you get, you have to move that weight and it's designed so you can move it. I showed you the brachiosaurus neck, the uh, 550 pounds of neck of a giraffe. Then you look at a brachiosaurus. Okay, now I can see why, you know, it's built that way. It's like an erector set, you know? You wanna build this so you can move the neck. It's gotta be hollow. So we look at that and couldn't help, but my revelation took place in 1993 when I looked at Jurassic Park. And so the big brachiosaurus. So I borrowed the video and I'm just gonna show you the front end of it. Watch this. Therefore, he's been extinct since the Cretaceous period. I mean, this thing is amazing. I love this expression. Here he is, Brachiosaurus. He's moving. When they did Jurassic Park 1993, they had experts, expert paleontologists, who understood about the movement of these dinosaurs. They didn't crawl, or they were so bulky that they move very slowly. No, this guy is moving. Like those giraffes, they move pretty fast when they start moving. The same thing here. Now look at the stomach. You see it? It's a dinosaur. And in a moment, you're going to see it stand up. And that's where I think I'm, I, 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 I have a feeling this is just me. I wasn't there. Job was, God was, but I have a feeling this is what Job saw. Here he comes. There you go. Standing up. Look at his stomach muscles. Look at his, look, look at the power of his muscles. Look at the power of his girth. That is a dinosaur. Isn't that amazing? When you look at that, you can see that. No other creature that exists or has existed on earth can match the biblical description of behemoth except a dinosaur. Do you agree? I, I, I am totally fascinated with these creatures. 
It took me a while because I always thought they were for kids. But then I realized they're for adults too, because you have to understand that God shows his majesty, his brilliance through the creatures he makes. And the behemoth must have been one of them. So dinosaurs and humans never coexist together. That's the myth. Point number two. There's a plethora of evidence that creatures that resemble dinosaurs or dragons roam the earth recently. So what does this mean? Does it mean that we have something, pictures of people and dragons? Not exactly. But here's a picture of something I really enjoy. This is the Badlands. We're digging for dinosaurs. We used to do this. I hope I can ever get this together again. I'm not sure if I can go up those high mountains. I'm getting old there. But I used to, oh, I used to go up, up those mountains and the Badlands, and we dug up dinosaurs. You notice that there's no vegetation around us. It's, it's, it's like desert up in the air, 2,000, 2,500 feet. Here we are, our crew, and we're digging up dinosaurs, CSI dig team. And so it's kind of fun. You're digging dinosaurs and you're having a good, good, you know, you have Kamari, you're telling each other stories. You're digging with a, with a screwdriver and a brush, especially when you find something, you, you know, you think you might be close to a dinosaur. You don't want to break anything. So I, I actually was sitting on top of the triceratops right back here behind. And, it was day, and I broke one of the bones over there. But we never found the whole thing. We find just parts of it. Okay, that's amazing. This is a frill. This is not from our dig, but we found lots of pieces like that. And you can notice that this frill has been put together. Now, why am I showing you this? Because I want you to be aware that dinosaurs appear, appear in history. Here is Malin, um, the Babylon chief, uh, god of Murdek. Uh, there's a pic supposedly a picture of him. Uh, what is he famous for? Well, he is the god that ruled over Babylon, the ma main city of ancient Mesopotam Mesopotamia. Murdoch was the supreme deity in, of all gods and is pictured with a pet dragon. Now you see it there, but basically what it was was a triceratops. It looked just like it. So they made descriptions of that. How about this, a stegosaurus? Now a stegosaurus is an amazing animal. You can stand maybe 18 feet, has small brain, because take a look at its head. Its, its cranial capacity was very small. We don't mark intelligence by the brainal capacity because God's built intelligence to each animal in a certain way. Um, so we know that because birds can migrate thousands and thousands of miles and it doesn't have all the instrumentation that we need in a, in a cockpit flying an, an airplane. No. So we understand that, that there are things that are made a certain way, designed a certain way to do what they need to do. Now, you notice that 20, uh, there's, there's theories that could have 17 and there's theory, theory that there's 22 plates they could be armor and so on. There's a lot of theories about that, but we know that Stegosaurus had those plates on top of it. Now, I want to introduce you to a place in Cambodia, Northwest Cambodia. This is a Tybron temple. Now you might say, I don't see a temple. You don't. You know why you don't see a temple? Because it's grown in. Uh, it's grown in. And this is a, the city of Angkor Thom. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, in Cambodia. Uh, it's Northwest Cambodia, as I mentioned. Uh, there are a thousand buildings in this area, 72 temples, Buddhist temples. The one that I want to, why I'm focusing on this is because you're going to see a stegosaurus. You ready to see it? Are you going to see the stegosaurus in the temple? Not exactly, but you're going to see it in the side of the building. There he is. It was built into the 12th century. So how in the world did they get stegosaurus there? Nobody knew about dinosaurs. See, if they lived millions and millions of years ago, who took a picture of one? Who took, I mean, if they, and there was nobody around, how did they get the concept of a stegosaurus? You see that I question. Let's go take a look at the other one. This is close by. This is in the, uh, these are petrographs. Petrographs are like drawings on rocks. And this is in the Grand Canyon. Uh, Hafsupe, it, that's an Indian area. It's made from Indian drawings. And you can see in this, you see drawings on the side of the cliff. Those are pictographs. There's a dinosaur sitting there. I don't know if you can see it, but Hubbard and Gilbert discovered this. And we have actually in our museum right now, there it is. 
It looks like a dinosaur. It looks like it's standing on its hind legs. The fact the animal is upright and balanced on its tail would seem to indicate that the prehistoric artist must have seen it alive. So we get pictures like this. What do we do with them? How about this? An ecostone. This is an ecostone. They're made of anisite. They're hard material, and you can carve things around them. Ancient Berberonian artifacts that depict man and dinosaurs, extinct creatures like prehistoric fish, ancient world maps, and what could be described as complex medical procedures right on those stones. It's amazing. So we see this, that's marking history, meaning that man and dinosaur could have coexisted. My favorite is Marco Polo. Yes, not the game Marco Polo, but Marco Polo, because he was a great discoverer. You see, Marco Polo was a trader and explorer who spent, who traveled through Asia, Persia, China, Indonesia from 1271 to 1291 AD. He recorded his journey in a work titled The Travels of Marco Polo and was published around 1300 AD. What did he tell us about? You'd be surprised. He told us Marco Polo chapter two, uh, part two, chapter 40, he states this. Quote, here are seen huge serpents, 10 paces in length, 30 feet, and 10 spans, about eight feet girt, the body at the forepart near the head. They have two short legs, having three claws like those of a tiger with the eyes larger than a four penny loaf on a, a very clarin. Uh, this is his words, not mine, so please don't. Tell me I'm mispronouncing things or I got the wrong words. The jaws were wide enough to swallow a man, the teeth large, sharp, and there were appearances so formidable that the neither man nor any other kind of animal can approach them without terror. So what is he describing? It must have been some sort of crazy dragon or serpent. You understand? These are creatures that we believe were extinct. Okay? We know about them because we've heard about them. They're, they're on every continent. For instance, how about this one? Man and dinosaur legend in England that dated around uh, 250, uh, 250 AD states that a brave man, St. George, slew a man eating dragon, which today is believed as to be a dinosaur called Baronyx. The Bible even tells us something amazing. You know what it tells us? It tells us that there are fire breathing dragons. Now, when I read this, I said, wait a minute. His sneezing, this is after chapter 40. We had the description of the behemoth. Now we're talking about Leviathan. His sneezing flashed forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. And out of the mouth goes burning light. Sparks of shoot out. Smoke goes out of the nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His, his breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. So what are they talking about? It could it be fire breathing dragons? And I would say yes. Why? Because that's biology. I don't have time to spend all night here, but I could, I could, I'd love to spend that time. Like the electric eel, I like to talk about the electric eel, how would the, the cells attack them. So when you touch it, you can get 5,000, 500 volt, I mean, 500 watts through you. It's a lot. It's lined up. It's it, all the cells are lined up. It's like taking, um, the cells we buy in the store and the tissues line them up just that way and you just put, stack them on top of each other. You got, you got your, your an electric eel or, uh, yeah, but seriously, that's what it's about. How about bioluminous? When I was up north, I saw fireflies, fireflies. Well, how do they get the light? They have no light bulb. You don't screw in a light bulb. You don't turn on electricity. You follow me. So let's not shortchange God's creation. I don't use the word nature. I say God's creation because I believe those things could happen. This is an amazing bug. This is a bombardier beetle. It's maybe about an inch big, inch in length. It could turn around and, and get you hot spray pretty bad. You can get its attackers either from every direction almost. Okay, it's really amazing. Where does that come from? Well, in his back. In the back, he has this chamber that has hydroquinine, hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide, an unbelievable concentrations so of literally when they come together, they explode. So how does that happen? 
You see, I can go through biology and show you that there are mysteries after mysteries of how things like this could happen. Yes, I believe in fire breathing dragons because I believe in biology. I also believe that God made it that way. That's what I believe. Okay. Now, myth number three, significant amount of current evidence demonstrates that dinosaurs are not millions of years old. Well, what are you talking about? I mean, dinosaurs are millions and millions of years old because they told me back. They supposedly dated their scientists. I mean, give me, give me a break here. First of all, let's take a look at the word dinosauria, which is dinosaurs. It was classified by Richard Owen in 1841. So when did we know about dinosaurs? in 1841 you're with me so dinosaurs came to be in 1841 no they were around look at the definition i love the definition he was a famous english paleontologist and this is what he wrote dinosaurs mean terrible lizard have you ever seen a terrible lizard i have how about this monitor lizard seven foot 150 pounds seen in one of our neighborhoods in florida <laughs> That's a pet. He got loose. Everybody was worrying. What happened? Oh my, I see this big thing. It's a monitor lizard. We had a person that wanted to raise one. Actually, I know him. I know that they grow this big. Okay. Um, here, you notice in the car, he's standing in the car. He's got a leash on. <laughs> so you get the idea that somebody's got a big pet. Not the ones that we like, but it's a big pet. That's called a terrible lizard. Could that be a dinosaur? Why not? We call it terrible lizards. We have the connotation that these terrible lizards are extinct. That's true. If you want to call them extinct, okay, you can use the word dinosaur then. So let's take a look. Here I am. Remember I told you I'd love to dig dinosaurs? Well, I'm between two heroes. One is Otis Klein. He owns the property. He's right here. And Joe Taylor, who is, who is a wonderful excavator. He can excavate any dawn. He can identify bones too. He's not a professional paleontologist. But they love this guy because they want him to dig up the bones and tell them what they are. What is that? That means he knows everything about dinosaurs. So he came and we looked at this bone and we cut it in half. And the reason why is a research group that was coming in and they were going to date the bone. Why were they going to date the bone? They were going to use carbon dating. What's carbon dating? Carbon dating is a way, radiometric dating, a way of telling how old it is. So we use that dating method because they don't like to use it because they say it only dates young things. But what happens if the young dating method dates old things? What happens? It's still a dating method, right? If we can find carbon in there, radiometric carbon, then we know that the dinosaur bone is not old. So take a look inside of it. That's where we took the sample. Somebody took a sample and gave it to the Creation Research Society. They took it and made a sample of it. And this is what happened. When they dated, it didn't say date 65 million years old. Actually, it didn't go over the scales. They said, we didn't have enough carbon to date it. No, they told us that we have enough carbon and it's thousands of years old. Okay. Now we've done this over and over again. Take a look at this. This is amazing. This picture here is collagen found in a 1916 Hell Creek formation. So they found this dinosaur, they brought it in. And they identified it. Mark Hummerich, uh, 1995, took it. And he said this. He said, I found collagen fi uh, filaments intact. It, it can't be but a few thousand years old. That's what he said. He also did work with electron microscope. And he found these osteocytes. What are osteocytes? They're cells of bone tissue. Bone grows around the osteocyte. When I taught anatomy, I told people that uh, the osteocyte is very important for bone buildup. You build up, that's the cell, and the matrix of the bone builds upon it. Very, very important. Ostracites. This is a dinosaur bone osteocyte. It looks perfectly intact. It's not living, but it's perfectly intact. Here's another one. Uh, these are all by electron microscopy. This is the best of all. How about this? This is from a 65 million year old T Rex found in South Dakota. Hell Creek formation where we dig dinosaurs. We didn't find it, but uh, a lady, which I'm going to introduce you in a moment, take a look at what she found. This is Mary Schweitzer, Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She found this kind of stuff. When she, she took the bone and tried to treat it, she used a higher concentration. Doing so, she got this instead. She found tissue. You can move the tissue back and forth. This is what she said. Uh, she found T-Rex tissue, Dairy Mary Heiberg, she, uh, Dairy Mary Heibe Schweitzer, 
from North Carolina State and University of Montana University. Conducted a study in tissue found on T-Rex dug out from a Hell Creek formation. She found this. Uh, the fossilized bone in the sense that it's from an extinct animal, but it doesn't have a lot of character of what people would call a fossil. Take a look. She found that stuff and it looked like it was real. She admits that discovery certainly shows that microstructures that look like cells are perceived in every way, like they are, exist today. Here's what she showed us. There they are. You see them. They're amazing. They're all in textbooks. You can actually see them. You can actually see the red blood cells, the soft tissue, and the vessels. You squeeze it, the stuff comes out. What does that mean? You mean to tell me that you can find fossils like that from 65? Hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Here's what we found. Conclusion, the T-Rex was walking on Earth not too long ago, science 2005. You see that? So when I see this, it, it, it affirms the fact that, that dinosaurs and man coexisted because we're, they seem to be young, just like we are. Now, how about this? Modern day fossils are found alongside the same layer, allegedly with 65 million year old fossils. I'm gonna introduce you to my friend, Dr. McGowan. He's a veterinarian. He joined us, he, he was part of our board. Uh, he's retired now, but he's, he was great. He was absolutely great. They love the veterinarians because they can identify bones and go on site and tell us all the bones we had. A, that was great. We found a lot of bones and he was good to identify. What's he do? He comes on a dino dig. We're all digging with our little screwdrivers. He nails a T-Rex tooth. He finds one just like that. I mean, that's like a golden find. It's like putting one, putting it, uh, putting your fishing line in and get one big one right away. As soon as we were there, 15 minutes, he picked it up. And so we were amazed. And this is what it looks like. You see it? Now, a lot of people are not aware of what a T-Rex tooth looks like. That's the end of it. And you can see the serrations along the side. This actual serrations. Those are serrations of like steak knives. I'm going to show you this a little bit later. There you come, you can come in close and you can actually see it. So where does it fit? Well, there's the T-Rex mouth. You can see the T-Rex mouth has big teeth, small teeth, okay? And we have this model in the museum, so feel free to take a look at it when we get done. Or those who are listening to me uh, online would love to show it to you. Come back, come down in Florida, and we'll give you a tour. Um, this is the T-Rex teeth. This is you can take a look at his mouth. Got 50 teeth. His teeth have, have evenly notched serrations. Those are the things I'm talking about. Like that tells me I have a uh, I have a T-Rex. A lot of people give me T-Rex teeth, but they're not real because I got to check the serrations. Serrations are very important. Then we look at this. The largest teeth could measure a foot in length. Pretty big, huh? Now, that's the largest teeth, about 12, 12 inches, about a foot. So here is this T-Rex tooth. Now, the most amazing thing, remember I told you that we were on a dig site that we found contemporary fossils with 65 million year old fossils. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is proof. When we were digging, Dr. Seward, Dr. I'm sorry, Dr. McCohen found that, that edge of the tooth. Next to it, about two feet next to it, we're digging at the same layer. Look what he picks up. That's a turtle scoop. Now, what's a turtle scoop doing with a dinosaur? This is a marine turtle. And we identify this because we identified this fossil in the Ice Age fossils. This is the same fossil I see in the Ice Age. It's part of a part of a, a shell. And so we look at this, and could it be that modern day animals roam with 65 million year old dinosaurs? Is there something wrong with that? Modern day fossils roam with 65 million year old fossils? Or maybe it was the opposite. Maybe the 65 million year old supposedly dinosaur was roaming with this, by the way, we think that whole area is because of a flood. So this is what I give it, excuse me. <laughs> but we have found, and we have found, I found a couple of other people who dug fossils, a paleontologist, uh, well known. And he said he's fine in human fossils. He's found um, contemporary human fossils with old fossils. 
we see mixes all the time on active digs. Notice what I said, active digs, okay? So we find, and what, what happens when they find a, a shell or they have enough material to identify that is a dinosaur. You know what they tell us? They say, well, it's another species because that couldn't live during that time. That turtle had to be old and they give it a different name. We see this a lot. So as I conclude, this is how I'd like to talk about it. This comes from Job. Then Job, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thought of. You ask, who is that that obscures my plans without knowledge? Now, you have to understand that uh, this is Job speaking to God. And God on Job 38 says, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. That's what God is saying to Job. Mind you, he's boils, he's sick, he lost his kids, lost everything. And God says, I will question you. Brace yourself like a man, I will question you, and you shall give me answers. And this is what Job says. Lord, I know this. You asked, who is that obscures my plans without knowledge? And he mentioned that people with him are obscuring his plans. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. This, God, this is Job speaking. Things too wonderful for me to know so what does he tell he's struggling he's got pain sorrows but he says god i didn't realize how wonderful you are and you demonstrated this to me you show me in chapter 38 you show me your unbelievable glory you you show me these beautiful creatures you show me the rocks you show me you show me so much that i now lord said you said listen now, and I will speak, I will question you, and you shall answer me. This is, this is the key part. He says, my ears have heard you. You ever hear of people with their ears? With ears? Ears. But my eyes, my eyes, but my, now my eyes have seen you. What is this referring to? It's referring to the fact that God literally told revealed himself to Job, that Job now comes to God and says, Lord, I've heard of this. In other words, I've heard of this, but now, Lord, I've experienced it. Think about our faith. It's all about experience. The fact that Jesus Christ came down on earth and died for our sins. He could have said, you're saved, but instead, we experienced that. We got to see him. He walked on this earth, just like us, who was born of a virgin. He was born a baby. Why, why did he go in a womb and be born like a baby? I mean, you think about it. He wanted to take the whole experience just so we can know him and experience him. That's the, one of the reasons why we have this ministry. We want to experience God. That's why we have these things, the trips and all this. We want, want to give God the glory. So as we conclude, I'm going to pray and I thank you for your attention. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask, Lord, that you be with us. And as we think about you, Lord, and about Job and his experience, Lord, we need to tell you all the time how we see you. We listen to you, but we see you. We experience you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you created us not just to be a partaker but be involved, just not being, you know, you're just told we're involved with you, Jesus. And that's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing testimony, Lord, that you've given us to us that we can utilize in our lives. In Jesus' name, they said, amen.